All right, now, welcome everybody. Um, we're recording and welcome to North Georgia Photography Club. As I was saying before, some things never change, but uh, we're slowly learning technology. <laughs> but we've got a good crowd here. Thank you everybody for coming out in the cold. Um, we got a lot of stuff to talk about today, some uh, changes that we're making to how the club um, operates uh, for 2024. And then we've got um, a Mark Mayo doing our presentation. And then we're going to have our uh, photo challenge, which is going to be done a little bit different this year also. And a lot of this is based on uh, your suggestions, recommendations when we did the survey uh, back in December. So we're going to talk business, going to talk about events, and then Mark will do his presentation, and then we'll do our photo challenge, which is rule of thirds. So I'm going to skip the part about dues now. I'm going to talk about the changes that we're doing for 2024. Uh, one of the biggest things um, we try to figure out what's the best way to make it easier for more members to attend meetings, and a lot of people seem to have um, other events going on on Fridays, a lot of conflicts. So based on the survey, Thursday seems to be the best night for most people. So beginning next month, we're going to start meeting on the third Thursday of the month instead of the third Friday of the month. For those of you who are in the uh, Forsyth County Club, that's when they met, but they're moving their meetings to the fourth Friday of the month. So we're not going to conflict. We will not I'm surprised I got that right, but <laughs> but we're not going to conflict with them. Uh, feel free to go to their meetings. Um, also, I encourage you to go to their meetings also, but uh, we're going to take their third Thursday slot beginning uh, next month. I think that's February 15th. Still going to be at 7 o'clock, and we'll see how that goes. And, you know, if that turns out Thursday's not good, we can always maybe change it again. All right, the next change, and this is going to be a big one. Uh, we have decided that beginning this year, you must be a paid member to attend meetings and to go on club trips. Now, to attend meetings, you have to be a paid member, but we will allow you to come to a meeting for free or watch on Zoom. One time the club is a good fit for you, you want to see what we do, we encourage you to come. Uh, but after that, to continue coming to the meetings and to enjoy the benefits uh, that other people are paying for, we're going to ask that uh, you pay. Uh, membership is only $12 a year uh, for a single person or for an individual, $30 for a family, and you get a lot for your uh, for that value. And all that money goes back to the club. Um, it goes to... Uh, Pay expenses such as Zoom, which I paid $159 for a couple of days ago for a Zoom subscription. Pays for rent for the uh, Bowen. It pays for equipment. Um, so your membership fees help support the club. We can't operate without that. So we would appreciate paying your, your dues. And for the people who are here tonight, if you have done so, do it now. Do it at the end of the meeting. We have a sign-in sheet there go ahead and sign in that you were here if you don't see your name on the list that means you haven't paid your dues yet so in that case go ahead and write your name at the bottom of the list and you could pay your dues or you can go online and uh and pay your dues um and we're also going to make it so that you need to be a liability issue uh we're still working with lawyers on that but um uh, that's starting new this year. Um, and like I said, potential members may attend one meeting for free to try us out and decide if they would like to join us. And uh, the last one here, we're going to have new rules for the monthly challenge, which is going to include a monthly award as well as uh, professional judging and critiquing. Uh, so we're not going to be voting um, anymore. We're going to have some a judge um, select the winners, and that judge will also do a quick critique of all the entries. Uh, Lisa is going to go over that when we get to the monthly challenge. Uh, so basically, though, if you haven't paid your dues yet, we would like it if you could pay your dues by January 31st. Now, you do have to be a paid member to attend monthly challenge, I mean, to uh, participate in the monthly challenge, 
but we'll let you do January even if you don't pay. Uh, likewise, this month, if you're not a paid member, this does not count as your free meeting. Your free meeting would begin in February because we hadn't announced it yet. Um, but yeah, you pretty much know everything that goes with um, a paid membership. We have a free mentorship program that we're going to probably reintroduce this year. We have our secret Facebook page. So um, yeah, please pay your dues. And if you can, by January 31st. All right, Rick, you're up. Field trips. Okay, can you hear me okay? Here we go. Can't tell. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks, Hylos. Yes. Yeah, field yes. trips. <laughs> um, we, you know, we did, uh, in fact, I actually met this club uh, when you guys were doing a field trip to Sloss Furnace. And I wound up joining the club uh, not too long after that. It was just a coincidence. But we're going to be going back to Sloss, uh, February 10th, Saturday, February 10th, which is coming up pretty quick. Um, and then we just added to that, uh, uh, Mike, I just sent you this update. We added to it for those who wish to um, do a trip on the way back. There's a, a pretty amazing vintage automobile um, um, I guess you'd call it a museum. And uh, uh, I don't have that in front of me, Mike. I'd... Sorry, I don't I don't even know the name of the place, but it's about 20. Uh, Arbor's What's that? Barbers? I think it's Barbers called. Barbers Motorsports. Yeah. yeah, I think that's it. It's called Barbers. So the plan would be for those who want to. Uh, Deuce Floss Furnace in the morning. It opens at 10. Um, have lunch across the street. There's a really good uh, bar food nearby. And then maybe uh, for those who want to, stop at the, at Barber's on the way back home. And they're open till 5, so we'd have a couple of hours to wander around through there. Uh, March 23rd, uh, for our wildflower trip, instead of the usual suspects, I've been looking into Arabia Mountain or one of them in Adnock. Uh, mountains. Larry Winslet, who has presented for us a couple of times before, um, is uh, masterful with uh, knowing the, those mountains and having access to them. He actually works for uh, Stone Mountain, I think. And Larry teaches classes up there. Anyway, he does some tours where he can take people into areas that you're not normally allowed to go to. And there's some very rare wildflowers that grow up there and only grow up there. So that would be a that would be a really fun trip. I'm working out the details with Larry on that. And we'll let you know more when we get closer. Um, Mike, the only other thing I'll put on there is uh, we will also have a birding trip to Florida in April. That will be Orlando Wetlands Park, Merritt Island, and probably a couple of other locations. Uh, date to be determined at this point. And that's it. And thanks, Rick. Yeah, uh, we had a good time last year. We went to St. Augustine uh, for birding. Uh, we were talking about uh, Orlando last year, so hopefully people can go to that. Um, we've had two people pay their dues so far since we've been talking, so thank you. And somebody sent a message. I didn't say who it was, but they said that they paid in November wanted to know if that covers this year if you paid after november 1st um that does cover all of this year so if you paid in november or december you're good for the year uh sometime next week i'm going to be sending out emails to people who haven't paid so if you don't get one of those you're good if you do get one of those and you think you have paid just tell me and i can look it up because in the past there have been one or two mistakes so we'll get that fixed uh workshops we don't have any workshops scheduled yet i've got some kind of in the uh planning stages we don't currently have anybody in charge of workshops so if you would like to lead a workshop this year uh, go ahead and uh, contact me i'm going to be contacting linda lester the uh, frog lady see if we can go ahead and get that scheduled i've been talking with mike robertson uh, I'm just going to be a speaker next month, by the way. 
um, about possibly doing a uh, workshop later in the year when it gets uh, warmer. So anybody else who's interested, just uh, let us know. We have um, our March speaker, and I can't remember his name now. Um, if you're on, I apologize, I'm forgetting your name, but he was, he's going to talk about grist mills. And back in November, we talked about possibly doing a grist mill trip. So that might be a workshop or a trip coming up too. So a lot of stuff planned. And before we start um, our um, presentation tonight, I forgot to make a slide for this, but I thought I would go ahead and let you know who is on our planning committee, who our officers are, because there have been a few changes from when we had the elections uh, basically in uh, November. Uh, so as you know, I'm the president. The uh, Based on our bylaws, um, I was appointed president uh, when Patrick uh, resigned. So I decided I agreed to uh, be president for one more year. So we will have elections again in November. Uh, we are looking for people to fill all the positions, uh, so including presidents, but I will be on for one more year. Dick is going to be our treasurer and secretary. So he's got two positions that we're doing. So it would be nice if we could find someone to help Dick out. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Mooney had been elected um, treasurer, but we appointed him to the board of directors um, since I was going to be on the board of directors and had to step down to be president again. So our board of directors are uh, Kevin Mooney, Michelle Grabowski, and Lisa Sains. And Lisa, I'm assuming you're on? Yep, I'm here. I hope Lisa's on because she has the photo challenge stuff. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right. Um, then our webmaster is uh, Corey Hutton. Uh, Rick Olson is now in charge of trips. And then we have a few, I guess you can call them at-large planning committee members, uh, Donna Grayson, Barry Smith, and Michael Gagne. And uh, Michael and Corey and Kevin are also running our uh, weekly challenges this year. And I don't think I left anybody out, but I just wanted to kind of introduce you to everybody who is running club. Oh, um, uh, oh, what's your name? McNan. Uh, Diane. Oh, Danielle. Dan Danielle, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I forgot you. She also joined us as a by large person on the on the planning committee. So uh, I knew I was forgetting somebody. So now we're going to get on with our meeting and our presentation. So I'm going to let Mark share his screen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let me make sure that up. This host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, you should be able to now. Yeah, it still says it's disabled. Here we go. And I need to escape this. See, Mike, the only thing I don't know how to do uh, is get to my desktop. Without, no, without the without the. Uh, uh, okay, click on okay, your screen share. So click on your click on. Uh, okay, I just leave. I want to leave Zoom in a sense. Yeah, and uh, you okay, should be You should be able to minimize the screen. Let's see if you. Uh, here we go. Let's see if it. Yeah. See if it should. Yeah. No, it's not. Okay, it's still behind my screen. There you go. We're good. All right. Okay. And uh, is this uh, microphone working? Do we? Yes. Okay. Hi, my, my name is Mark Mayo. I'm a, a new member just in and just before the end of the year and uh, you know, volunteered to do a presentation and got picked. Um, 
Uh, what I want to do is this presentation is probably different than most presentations that are at photography clubs or organizations is that it's not going to be about anything about cameras or lenses or software or plugins or anything. This is about the other sort of 20% of, of what we do in photography uh, as we move through our life. So it's called photographic life lessons. And um, it's because I've looked at my life in photography and looked at what I've learned and how it's helped me uh, as a photographer. My, my life, my, uh, so about me, I'm, I'm a, I do what's called ophthalmic photography, imaging inside the eye. I also do um, fine art photography and those, those two have been parallel for the last 50 years. And I'm also a realtor here in the area of with Keller Williams. So that's sort of the three legs of my of my business tripod. Um, on the ophthalmic side, I was vice president, I say was, vice president of, of an Israeli ophthalmic device company, the only non-Israeli in the company. And as a October 7th, <laughs> we have no company because all my colleagues 40 and under fight the front line and all my colleagues 40 and older are in the reserves taking their place in the in the military. So right now I have some time. And um uh so to 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 start here, it's it's you know, I guess if we're here, ask questions like on online, can people type in type in questions on the chat? So don't worry about interrupting. Um and this is looking at both halves of my photographic life and how they played on one another and how I got there. So there's a movie, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's first movie is called Sliding Doors. And I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's actually two movies. And in, and it's based on her. In, in one, she's working in London in an office building and she leaves work early and she sort of misses the elevator door, misses the door you know, going out the front door, misses the 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 uh, subway door and gets back to her apartment and her boyfriend there and everything's fine. Then it sort of reverses and he gets, makes all the doors and catches her boyfriend in bed with her girlfriend, her, her best friend, right? And so, you know, in, in my life, I've looked at that. There's always been doors that have opened and I have to make choices. And, you know, you can choose one door, you can choose another door, or even if you don't make a choice, then somebody will actually end up making a choice for you. So this is about looking at my life photographically, what I've learned and how it's how it's applied to my photography. Uh, and way back in the beginning, it's it's uh, a, as a as a as a kid, um, you know, this whole thing from the Rolling Stones, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. And for me. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 100% Sicilian, Catholic, went to a went to a Catholic grade school. You know, back then we had no idea, did my father make money or not? We were sort of lower blue collar, you know, but we never felt that way. I had a great, but, but we didn't have a lot of money. And so back then, the Catholic schools would have these candy sales and they would use the money from the candy sales to do buy things for the church, right? And I didn't have a bike. And I, there was, you know, we're going to we're gonna have this candy sale. First prize is that Murray bike, right? And 1963. And I determined, I was determined that I was going to win that bike. And I went and sold it to my neighborhood, all the blocks around, sold it to my relatives, went to the busiest intersection close to my house, sold it there. I knew that I had gotten that bike. And so we, the day comes that we're going to, they're going to announce the winner and I'm sitting there in the, in the auditorium and on the edge of my seat, cause I'm going to be ready to pop up and claim the number one, you know, prize. And the mother of the parent teachers association is running this. She announces the winner and it just happens to be her son who sells one more box of candy than I did. Okay. Second place was a camera outfit. And so it's sort of in that, that, that realm of, you know, sometimes you get what you need, even though you think you want this, you end up with, with, with what you're supposed to get. And so that sort of was 
the beginning of, and we know it in photography, it's like, you know, being rejected. You, you enter something in or whatever it is in your life and you reject it and you think it's terrible. But typically what happens is you end up going someplace else that's that's better. And for me, I wanted to, you know, I, I was in school and in, in high school, I wanted to be, I, I loved art. I wanted to be a painter, right? And so I do this charcoal drawing and uh, I get it back and you can see that red, the red line around it, you know, and on the back and this thing, this thing took a, it was a 16 by 20 board and, and the art teacher, you know, this C minus was a gift and it goes on to get worse from there. Right. Which then basically moved me away from thinking that that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, we take our, we take our images, we, we put them out there for judging or for critique and we listen and you know, we take what we can get from it and then reject the rest because it's not just because somebody gives you a critique doesn't what they're saying is is really best for you. So starting to learn that. Um, and then also, you know, I was in high school. My friends and I play you know, the only time you'd be able to, to watch anything other than football or baseball or basketball on the TV was wild world of sports, right? And they had once a year they had the the, the you know the poker championship of the world, right? And this guy Emerald Slim, you know, they have a million dollars on this table. And he wins, right? And they interview him and, he, and they go, Emerald, you are the greatest poker player in the world." And he's like, "Well, he says I just happened to be the best poker player at the tournament." this weekend the great poker player in the world could be some guy who in detroit who plays poker every saturday with his buddies in his garage right and so then that start again got me thinking that you know awards and who's the greatest and who gets this are really all very subjective and that you know i have to worry about myself not what everybody else was saying i in high school i decided i was going to be a printer and I live in Milwaukee, huge printing industry there, right? You get you get your degree in printing, you had a job, right? Which my my mother and father loved because then I was going to have work, right? And and but I had at the end of my senior year in high school, I got a I sent my cousin money in Vietnam, and he sent me a camera, and I developed my first roll of film. Like we you know we talk about anybody, it's not at the first time you see that image come up, you think it's magic, right? Uh, it's always funny now because you never hear somebody say, you know, I put that card, that, that SD card in the computer, and then I hit the print button and it came off the printer and it was just magic. I mean, that, that doesn't happen anymore. But I, I, you know, and this is back in the time when you were actually typesetting with real type, right, and having to learn this. And I had a, I had a class, we, we had an intro class in the first year, printing, visual communications, photography, and something else. And I was looking forward to going to photography class and I couldn't stand going to my printing class. And one of the women that both of them were Italian, they all their parents knew my parents. I would never have gone up to this woman had I not had some connection. I'm, she's in the student union and she's got all these contact sheets and she's looking through them. She's a year ahead of me. And I start talking to her. I'm looking at her contact sheets and she and I and I go, you know. I would just love to be a photographer. And she says, well, then be, why don't you just be a photographer, right? And it was that, and I changed my major. It was that it's sort of that simple, somebody almost giving me permission. Um, you know, I put myself through school working in a steel mill set shift. Um, and, you know, that, that was that day, you know, the two most important you know days in your life when you're born and when you find out why you're and what purpose you were. And from that point on, my life was photography. I knew that I was going to be doing photography as long as I lived. You know, typical, you know, like I said, being in the dark room, learning, uh, learning film. But we, we, I didn't go, I went to a technical college. They didn't teach us anything about art. They told us how to be photographic problem solvers so we can get a job actually using photography, which was, which was wonderful. Um, and so we did all kinds of things, uh, curly in photography and all these different types of things to understand the process and making holograms and using lasers to do this. This is back in like 1975. And I'm like thinking, 
excuse my language, what the hell am I ever going to have to know something about a laser? I mean, little, little, little did I know that in ophthalmology, now all the imaging is done with scanning lasers, right? And lasers being used to treat the eye. But, you know, back then you're a stupid kid and you're like, what do they know? The other thing is we they learned, they taught us how to do a dye transfer print. I don't know if any of you know about a dye transfer print, but what you do is you get a transparency, you make three exposures on, on black and white negative film, right? And so you have one through red, um, uh, uh, green and blue exposures. And then you go through this process where uh, you then put them in things of, of dye, uh, yellow cyan mag magenta, and then you put them down and transfer that to make a print. Again, I'm like, why do, why do I need to know about you know, cyan, yellow, magenta? Why do I need to know about these dyes? You know, how is that ever gonna, gonna affect me as a photographer? Again, you know, had no idea we were gonna do digital printing. We learned photography using a, a four by five view camera. That was photo 101. They didn't let us touch a 35 millimeter camera until our second year. So, um, and our Bible, was Ansel Adams, the camera, the negative, and the print. That's how we learned photography. Four by five view camera, these books, learning Ansel's zone system. And of course, he was very popular then. And like probably all of us, we find a photographer. And to me, you know, I'm gonna I wanted to be, you know, the next Ansel Adams because I loved his, you know, his his work. And of course, his initials were AA. Mine were MM, so somehow that was some cosmic way of telling me that I was going to be the next Ansel Adams. You know, um, little little did I know that I can't figure out that a, a kid from the south side of Milwaukee wasn't like living in the west coast in Yosemite and making. I wasn't going to be making the grand western landscape sitting in Milwaukee, but that was that was beyond what I can uh, could figure out then. And then you know his his theory and his his mantra was you don't take a photograph you make it and that was drilled into our heads we don't take photographs we make photographs and I've always approached everything done that way and he always felt that if he made twelve good negatives in a year that was a good year you know and we you know that you know, here here's here's this this person I'm looking up to over here who's thinking twelve good photographs in a year and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like get a couple a year. Um, I always love this. There's nothing worse than a sharp image of a fu fuzzy concept. So we can, you know, have this beautiful exposed negative sharp from front to back, but if it doesn't say anything, does it work as, as a photograph? And I was alive and it was, his work was popular and he, and in this project on Minamata, um, I don't know if you if you guys have seen that there's actually a movie with Johnny Depp called Minimai where he where he plays Eugene Smith and it's a really good mo movie. So I started looking at that projects rather than single photographs. And uh, Henry Cartier Brazon, decisive moment, looking at the time, just everything comes together and you and you click the shutter. But they also they actually while well, we didn't talk a lot about art. They said to us, if you want to be a good photographer, study painters and painting. And I did. I took that up. And and so at the time, uh, this uh, Edward Hopper, Hopper's Nighthawk was a very popular poster. And so I I started looking at Hopper's work, right? And I I saw the way he looked at light and how he used light and painted light. And that started me on you know a lifelong journey in my photography where it's about light. I look at the light. People say, what do you photograph? I say, I photograph light. Um, the other photographer was Charles, or painter was Charles Sheeler, who did you know, uh, these types of paintings, which again, for me, being from Milwaukee, industrial city, I was gra I gravitated to them. They were very realistic. Again, the way he used light. Um, but what I didn't, what I also knew, and I didn't know how it was going to affect me, was he was also a photographer. So on the left, this image of the River Rouge plant, the Ford plant that he was hired to photograph. But on the right, here's the Buffalo's um, grain district. And I knew this photograph, but I had no idea. And we'll get to it later, how it affected my life. Um, so uh, the form of life I said is, you know, there's no better time to crop a photograph than when you're there actually photographing. So again, that got pushed and I kept on looking at that. How can I how can I, through my viewfinder, 
compose this. And, you know, I guess, you know, there's a say, there's a story about Michael, Michelangelo and they're like, how did you get David out of this block of granite? You know, and his supposed response was, I just took away everything that wasn't supposed to be there. And I sort of took that into myself. And, and when I'm looking through my viewfinder is only include the things in the viewfinder that need to be there and nothing and nothing else. Like, did I do it like that? No. But over the years, I've I've position myself to do that and you know these here are some images these are images i this image i actually did while i was in school four by five view camera um uh four by five view camera this was a, a uh, assignment to do a self-portrait and i felt like that white wall and when i was living in milwaukee i just knew that i wasn't going to be living in milwaukee the whole time um and uh you know again back then all we had was a black and white tv so i saw the world in black and white yeah you know, a lot of movies back then were actually black and white if you look at those movies and you see the way they're lit you can really learn a lot about photography by looking at those movies from the 40s and 50s um so and also i was also the remote control because we only had three stations and my dad would say mark go over there and turn to the channel six um but we also were were, were forced and taught to learn um you know to look at things as if they were in black and white. So one way is we had a viewing filter we'd run around our neck and we would look at these scenes and we'd be able to take and look and see zone system, zone three, zone eight, blah, blah, blah. And that's and we but we start we started to learn how to look at something like this and then as Ansel Adams would say, pre-visualize it into something like this. So, you know, it's funny because now, you know, you we're using digital. I never look at the back of my camera. I mean, to me, looking at the back of the camera is editing. When I'm photographing, I'm photographing, I'm in the zone. I don't need to look at it because for 35 years, I couldn't, I couldn't look at it until I developed films. I have no desire to do that. A lot of people do, but that's just me. That's the way I... Um, I also in school found out, figured out what type of photography I didn't want to do. Life magazine folded. I wanted to be a documentary photographer once I chose photography. I wanted, I felt like, oh, I was going to do these stories that were going to help change the world or change somebody's life, right? Have some impact on people. And then, and then Life magazine folded. Um, in college, we had, all the photographers had, general classes together so we can take all of our photo classes together so we had english together and they made us do a research paper on some aspect of photography we didn't know about which i think is a brilliant idea because it all got us to start looking at things that we wanted to to work in and i found medical photography and i said what better way for me to 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 help people than being a medical photographer i take all these skills right my mother thought well you know all you're going to do is take baby pictures right um but no i mean yeah i took baby pictures but yeah photographing this is free and birth for teaching purposes right so all the teaching hospitals did things like through the microscope slides of things um but I, at the same time i started looking at it in an artistic way you know this this photo it doesn't really give the doctor any information that's relevant to what they're looking at but it's to me it was my way of being creative outside of outside of work um and i also started photographing all the time you know it's it wasn't i'm gonna i photographed i had my camera with me all the time uh, i gave myself self-assigned projects to do i was always out photographing I didn't just photograph a couple times a year. I mean, my ph photography, I tell people, photography is my life. It's, sometimes I'm doing medical at that time. Sometimes I'm doing my own work, but continue to do it. So I did I did a project on one area of Milwaukee that I would go and I'd be carrying my four by five view camera and photographing um, uh, people and places in this part. And this, I, I did a project where I went out every every Christmas morning before when the, when the town was kind of quiet and I could go out and photograph before all the family stuff started in the afternoon. So I, I did that. I just gave myself assignments to do. Um, and I made a decision. Most of my 
friends that were in photography, once we got out of school, all went to Europe and traveled and photographed. And I said, I can't imagine going to Europe until I understand my country. And so I did, which started decades of me driving the back road of America and photographing, exploring and learning. So I did that, you know, photographing my own backyard rather than going trips of, of just a couple images from these, from these trips. Um, and again, I never did like research. I just would pick a route and go down the, down some back road and then, Wherever I ended up that night, I'd I'd uh, <laughs> I'd stay, and I did the same thing. Uh, this is all in Milwaukee, but you know, in Georgia, I d I've done the same thing. Uh, I was down in I think Washington, Georgia, or something. What is that? That yeah, the the the, the Cuba, Georgia. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Um, Tearing apart the kids and breaking all of them out. Yeah, that's. Seems like what it has a lot of history. Yeah. yeah, I don't know any of the history, but I always, you know, I always drove by it, right? Uh, tire sale in Washington, Georgia. Um, and I also started looking at, you know, here there, you know, we, of learning photography is looking at other photographers' work, but decided that I needed to, to, to like not do things that were going to please other people or be like other people's photographs i needed i needed to uh to just please myself and and do the best i could to make the types of photographs that meant something to me and that said something um i was working as a medical photographer i heard about this thing called and i was like what better way for a photographer to help people than with their vision we did all kinds of photographs in and around the eye to do diagnosis and treatment of eye diseases and clinical trials and drug clinical trials. So it was all this stuff that we're doing to help people. Um, I mean, you look at the eye and the cross, everyone that eye has some photo, special photographic diagnostic test done to it using different types of equipment. So it was a very challenging, you know, I learned photography, but I also learned ophthalmology. It was at a time when ophthalmology was really starting to come to, into its own as a subspecialty in medicine, right? So this is just a, a, a montage, two images of the back of the eye. One at the top is the normal white light color of the retina. The other is, a, is, is what's called a fluorescein angiogram. We'd inject sodium fluorescein in the vein in their arm and we photograph it as it goes through the arteries and the veins and they then could use that this is a normal eye but they could use that to to, to make diagnosis and they use the photographs to use laser on the eye to figure out where they're going to do it um i did that up in milwaukee i got recruited to come to emory to london department at emory just as we were building this huge eye institute and uh making emory one of the top eye ophthalmology departments in the world. And so I came down here and ran that. I started with myself. And when I left, I had six people working for me just doing photography of, of, of the eye. And this is when I really started looking my, at myself as this combination of art and science and, 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 and being able to sort of go, go back and forth between it a little bit more on one side, sometimes a little bit more on the other. But I started, these are just some images uh, of, of the eye. This is on a, we'll put a lens with a mirror on the eye to look at the, the iris and this, this cyst on the iris. And here's some, some cysts on the back in, of the iris. But I, I would always photograph it and then go beyond that for me and do something that, that was more artistic, uh, so to speak. Uh, this image became a, this, this image became a huge poster that, uh, for Merck Pharmaceutical. Um, you know, did things, this was, this was a project I did, you know, following the, uh, you know, so a surgical process and, you know, having the, a little, you know, girl have surgery. And, um, I also, on my personal work was doing a four by five view camera. I had a dark room. I was, I was all, you know, doing my tests on my film. I was doing, you know, what kind of paper, what kind of developer should I use? And I was, I was so engrossed in like trying to, do I get this lens? Do I get this camera? If I just do this, it's going to be better. 
And I, I, I made these technically perfect, boring photographs that didn't say anything. But it took me years to figure that out. It was something I was just doing because I felt like I needed to do it before I realized that's just sort of like the uh, the way to get into the game, which I think is may maybe next. Um, uh, you know, and then also, you know, looking at this, you know, I'd, I'd go or I'd, I'd go with friends and, oh, I got up at four in the morning and we climbed, you know, two miles up into the mountains and blah, 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 and we photographed. And then they come back and it's like, you know, well, yeah, you know, aren't these great? Well, maybe, maybe not. Just because you did that, just because you did all that stuff doesn't make the photograph great, right? And you can make a great photograph doing nothing but walking out your front door and making it. So I started realizing that. Um, and then I also realized in my own work that, you know, you're there, you're seeing the beautiful out, and somehow you associate that feeling with that photograph. And you want to have that photograph have that feeling, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have that feeling just because you were there and it felt that way. So I had to start separating myself from this. And, you know, I did, I did a lot of work that was, you know, landscape, nice pictures, uh, but they weren't, they weren't really to me saying anything. Um, and I said, I tried, you know, different cameras. You now I had a, Hasselblad, I had a, uh, you know, different, you know, macro lens, this and that. I, if I could just do this, it's going to be better. Um, and I also learned that, you know, we all learn by mistakes and, and that, that, um, you know, as Tim Feinstein says, if you've never made a mistake, you haven't tried anything new. So, you know, I made every mistake that you possibly can, and I've invented new mistakes, I'm sure. So, I read this book, The Power of Moments, and there's a story in it of what have you, you know, what have you failed at lately? It was a, a father who, who every Friday night would get his children together at, at, at the dinner table and ask them what they had failed at that week, right? So that you could talk about that and learn from, from what they did. And so, you know, I mean, now I... <laughs> I mean, if I go out and make 500 exposures, there's probably only at the max five images that are quote good, and probably one or two that I'm I'm ever going to use and show. Right. So I mean, that's how I, I mean, you know I have a I have a 99% failure rate when I'm out there. You know, I I, I I'm the, probably the the biggest failure of any photographer. Um, also, then I I. Um, uh, John Sexton, uh, uh, I'll probably talk about, uh, I think it's in here about going to the Ansel Adams workshop, but John, you know, gave talks about it. And he said, you know, he talked about the best accessory in your, in your camera bag is a U-turn because we all go down the road and we all see things that we want to photograph and we say, Oh, I'll come back. And we, you know, and then we never come back. Right. Uh, I mean, the, probably the, one of the most famous stories, and maybe you've heard this is, um, Jim Marshall, the rock and roll photographer who did a lot of the album covers in the in the 60s and 70s. And so Crosby, Stills and Nash formed as a group. They were at Columbia Records and they want they needed a photograph of the cover. So he takes them out in Hollywood and there's that old that old house that's there and he puts them on the porch. There's, I don't know, a, a couch or something. And he makes a photograph of them. They didn't even, they didn't even have a title of their band. Right. So they come back and they go, OK, well, you know. We're going to be called Crosby, Stills, and Nash, except in the photo it was Crosby, Nash, and Stills. And like, no problem. We'll just go tomorrow and rephotograph it. And they go the next day and the house is torn down. They like the photograph so much they use. So I mean, those are the things is that, you know, go there. Yeah, and here, here's just an example. Uh, we I, we have a home on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, and you know, driving down the road, and I see you know this young couple photographing one of the Highland cows, right? So I go past it, I make a U-turn, I come back, and um, ask them if I can photograph them. They said sure, and I make the photograph, right? And so yeah, that's the U-turn. But then we're sitting there, and my wife and I are talking to three people, a couple and this guy. And it's like, this, this is the way this guy dresses. It's not like he's some, two. and they, the, these two are actually from Atlanta, 
in North Carolina. And we start talking. And 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 he says, the, the his friend says, Oh, can I photograph you? And I said, Oh, can I photograph you? And then, yeah. So, you know, there's that whole thing about, you know, if I didn't turn around and photograph the couple with the cow, I wouldn't ever photograph them. And then the other one is the it's 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 I call it the way back. So, you know, you're I, you go down the road, some back road, and you see things and you're photographing, but they always look different when you come back the other way, right? And you see things that you don't see. So here, this this is a ruins of an old church about a mile north of our house. And so in the morning, wife and I are driving along the ocean. I see this. The storm just comes. I make the photograph. Later in the day, we come back, and from the other side, this is what it is. So, you know, I, I'm always looking at what it is I can I can do. Yeah, number 13 is someday. We all have the, someday I'm going to do this, right? Someday I'm going to take this trip. Someday, And for me, it was someday I'm going to do the Ansel Adams workshop. And then he died. And so, and so but they had, they had the workshop scheduled, even though he had died. And so I took it. And it changed my life photographically. Um, I thought it was going to be about, exposure development making prints it had nothing to do at all with anything technical it was all about why you were photographing and looking at each other's photographs looking at the photographs from the people that were there jerry ulsman was there urs haas was there paul Campanegro was there john sexton was there and you were looking at talking about they were looking at your work and you started thinking about it in a completely completely different way um one of the things you could do at the workshop was David Bales and um, uh, Ted Orland. Ted was one of Ansel's assistants. You could get a, a critique of your work, just you personally. And it was in Ansel's living room. And so at night, and so I go there and I've got, you know, my 16 greatest hits of photographs you know, that I've ever made. None of them are connected with anything other than the fact that I made them, right? And they put all these 16 photographs on the chairs and the couch and everything and they had 15 minutes looking at and then they go you photograph them a distance about like this they go and they put their hand right in front of my face and that was worth the whole thing for the workshop because number one that's exactly the distance i was photographing patients in ophthalmology i get 25 people a day that i have to have a quick relationship with get them in flash bright lights in their eye and stick a needle in and inject dye right and so i was keeping myself that that i was keeping that distance and they said tomorrow he says we're going up to the high sierras what i want you to do is i want you to find something you want to photograph and put your camera down and don't make a photograph for at least 30 45 minutes walk around it let it tell you how to photograph it that's what i did and i made this photograph um so but they should have done it and said, make one right away and make it do that, right? To, to show it started getting me thinking in that way. Look at that and not just, okay, it looks nice, react, I've got a camera, boom. It's slowing down, looking, letting it tell you, moving around, doing the thing of, you know, is something this photograph that should be there or should I get it out of there? Um, I love Miles Davis, always have. And I love this line is that sometimes you have to play a long time before you're able to play like yourself. And I think it's the same thing true, holds true with being a photographer. You, you've got to do a lot of photography before you really find what it is. Um, I also started looking at, you know, I looked at it and I said, I'm the competition. Not I'm not trying to make a better photograph than any of you here. I just am always trying to make a better photograph than I did the time before and learning from it, right? And 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 if I lived, I, I, by the time I was 20 years old, I, I said to people, number one, I'm never going to retire because I'm always going to photograph. And number two, if I live to be 100, I'll never be as good as I want to be in, in, in pushing myself. So, uh, you know, that's my competition. I uh, went from Emory to the uh, State University of New York in Buffalo. Now, Here's a guy with a two-year associate degree in photography, all ophthalmology experience, and I go up there as an assistant professor of ophthalmology in the medical school. So figure that out. Plan that one. Plan that one in your in your life, right? I mean, but I knew so much about ophthalmology because I was there in these formative years, and I, I was at Emory and 
So I went up there and I went, one of the reasons I went up was because the chairman of the department was somebody I worked with at Emory and his life wasn't just ophthalmology. It was art. It was poetry. It was music. And so I knew that I would have a support system there to do something other than just ophthalmic photography. Um, I became an adjunct professor at Rochester Institute of Technology, which is, has a huge biomedical photography program and photography. It's only 60 miles away from Buffalo. Um, but when I was there, I you know I had a two-year associate degree. I said, you know, I want to get a four-year degree. And so part of the SUNY system is Empire State College. It's a, it was the 70s. It was so far ahead of its time. It was like, we will help you create a degree for yourself and we will we will put you one-on-one -on -one with professors to take your classes and you do them on a time that, that's convenient for you instead of I got to quit my job and go to school full-time. And so I did that. I, I started getting my degree through SUNY, the chapter in, um, and I, I said one of the things I was interested in was um, ethnic neighborhoods in northern industrial cities. I mean, that's where I came from. Every time I go travel, that's what I would photograph. So they hooked me up with a professor of history who had written these three books about Buffalo. And they said, and he said, oh, you're a photographer? I'll tell you what, it's a 16-week course. I want to take you around Buffalo. You pick a neighborhood and study it with your camera. That 16-week course took the 16 years of my life, okay? I found this neighborhood that turned out to be an Irish neighborhood and reminded me of the Italian neighborhood, my parents, you know, and I started walking around and photographing. And the more I photo, I mean, literally, by then I had made the determination that all these cameras I had were really, in, in a sense, useless. And I'd gotten a, a Leica, I'd been using it since 1983 with a 35 millimeter lens. And so, you know, the 35 millimeter lens for me equates my field of vision my field of view, right? And I I had my film, I had the, the Leica M4P, it didn't even have a light meter in it. And I walked around and photographed with a couple rolls of film in my pocket and just met people and studied and learned about the neighborhood and made photographs. Yeah, but to me, it was sort of, here's this neighborhood and it's in the middle of train tracks and, and this industrial, uh, the river and, um, yeah, again, different people from the neighborhood or from other neighborhoods coming down. People, Joey here owned a, a, a bar in town in, in the neighborhood. So I got to know him and, you know, I, photo I photographed him as he's waiting for his buddies to come and play cards after lunch. Um, and then one day, I mean, I knew there were grain elevators there, but I had no idea. One day I walked around this grain elevator and literally this is what I saw. And I made this photograph and they invited me up and here's a grain boat. And unloading grain, guys are unloading grain by hand with these huge shovels that are attached to this big tower over here. And that started that 16 thing because these guys were the descendants of the Irish guys who hand dug the Erie Canal across the New York State. They were the low, low end labor that then lived along the terminus of the canal in the Irish old first war that I was photographing. And they continued to unload grain uh, using a technology that was invented in 1843. So this is like 1990. And these guys are, this is inside the, the, the grain boat looking up as all these uh, ropes and everything. And they're using this technology still to unload grain in Buffalo. And I find out that in 1900, there were 3000 of these guys. And when I started photographing, there was only 80. And I said to myself, this is not going to last forever. And I'm sort of been chosen to document this. And I did. I started that 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 project of documenting what they were doing. Uh, I got my, um, yeah, Eugene Smith's, you know, great depth of field, but in the nonetheless, they have a great depth of feeling. And that's what I started, you know, having a, knowing about it. I mean, we say a picture is worth a thousand words. No one ever adds only you've got a thousand words to say. And so I had, to, I had to be able to say something, learn something about this before I could say it. And so I did, uh, I, I finished my degree and then decided I'm doing all this work and I got to do this research, blah, blah, blah. I need to get a master's degree. So 
put together a master's degree, find two professors who will te- who, who will put me under their, their wing, right? And I start learning about oral history and documentary and all kinds of things, all the while f- making these making these photographs. And I kept on saying to myself, well, you know, I'm photographing them. I'm the only one that's been allowed to go down in there. It's like, well, you know, like, where does this stuff come from? You know, what, you know, obviously it comes from the Midwest. I mean, here, you know, some of my professor's books that I, that I had to read uh, and, and, and apply. Um, so one of my students, and I, I started the degree program in ophthalmic photography. One of my students had a cousin who had a weed farm in Kansas. So I made arrangements and that summer I went, and lived on the wheat farm with the family to photograph. So I wanted to follow it from the, the field all the way back to Buffalo. By this time, I've learned that only a little of it goes to Buffalo because they opened up the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959 and everything bypasses Buffalo because of that. And it also goes down the Mississippi to New Orleans where a lot of it goes out. So, But anyway, I mean, I lived with the, the family. I photographed in the small town. Uh, I did that for a couple summers, um, you know, Joel's the guy on the right. You can't you can't cut wheat until it dries, and so everybody gets together for breakfast before it dries. And you know, photo around in camps in different small. This is down in New Orleans where they um, instead of having these twenty guy or forty guys at a time unloading a grain boat in Buffalo, they've got two guys running an automated system to unload the 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 barges of wheat that come down. So you know, there's that whole change. You know. Um, and then I also started looking at, I mean, studying Minor White, um, who, who said it's not just photographing what something is, it's what else it is. You know, what, can you, what can you look at or have a viewer look at that might see, you know, show them something else that they don't, that they don't know. So, you know, in, in this case, I mean, this is, oh, the other thing, I, then I made arrangements to, to, to meet a grain boat up in Duluth, Minnesota, and take a trip on a grain boat from Duluth to the Great Lakes, to Buffalo, and back. Um, most people know the name George Steinbrenner. George Steinbrenner got his money from his father's money doing shipping on the Great Lakes. That company still would hire these guys that were called grain scoopers. So I got passage on his boat, on his suite, to go back and forth and learn the whole process. But, I mean, here they're loading the the, the grain in Buffalo, uh, in, in, in Duluth, Minnesota. But, you know, looking at this, you know, I'm, I'm photographing, photograph coming in, and then it's like, you know, this looks like a quarter note to me, you know, right? Uh, and I also then started looking at, I was, I was using my, my, my Leica 35 millimeter lens. That was it. And then I started showing the photographs, and people didn't get the combination of huge grain elevators, people working in small places. So, I would do when I would do go out west and photograph, you know, you're driving for miles, right? And there's nothing. And I would sort of like look at my rear view mirror and make photographs as I was driving, you know, sort of compose things. And I thought, well, I need a camera like that. And so then I got the Linhoff 617 and I started making images because I knew I was going to have an exhibition so that I can make big prints, give an idea of the relationship and size to the people. At- in uh, Salina, Kansas, and here's the inside of one of the one of four holes in, in one boat as it starts filling. And this was a, an image I made coming out of Duluth Harbor. It was raining there, and um, uh, it was a boat I, I I came in on along the Buffalo one of the elevators in the Buffalo River. I mean, grain elevator was invented in Buffalo. There are more grain elevators in Buffalo than anywhere else in the world. There's only two that are still working right now. Um, so this work started getting shown. I gave talks, and then I was asked. Uh, the George Eastman House bought a twelve print portfolio of the work for their permanent collection. So that helped in terms of in terms of being a photographer and opening more doors. Um, that has led to in April of of twenty twenty five. There will be a, a major exhibition of this work in the Birchfield Penny Art Center in, in Buffalo. There'll be a book that comes out with it and and uh, a PBS special on this. But that started in 1989, and now it's 2024. So, you know, it's that longevity. I worked on it for 16 years, right, without, you know, 
knowing that this would ever happen. Uh, you know, don't be afraid of change. Um, you know, Ansel, before he died, was already predicting that we were going to be doing something electronically, right? Um, for me, in, in, in ophthalmology, we were using digital imaging in 1984. 512 by 512 K black and white on a camera to photograph the eye when you did that dye test. But, and I was, no, it's not anywhere close to being as good as film. If I wouldn't do this on my mother and father, I'm not going to do this on a patient. So I'd be the, I, but it's true, right? I mean, yeah, it was faster. It was easier, right? Because a lot of times you'd get something and you'd, you'd have to photograph it and then process the film right away because they might need laser treatment. And by tomorrow, it could have grown and they can't treat it anymore. So there was that uh, expediting this. Uh, but I, I was the big mouth that said no, because I was this, you know, and um, and then and then one of my former students is selling now commercial digital imaging systems, right? Really expensive, you know, larger sensors, blah, blah, blah. And he says, Mark, you know, Philips has come out with a full frame size 35 millimeter sensor that's six megapixels, right? And and so and he and I had always talked because we use 35 millimeter film on the cameras for the retina. And we're like, how can we how can we put a digital back on there that didn't have to have some optical, mechanical, electrical changes to fit on the camera? You can just swap it out. And so I I checked it out. I there was a big photo show in Atlanta. I put a business plan together. I went to all the companies that were selling them, including phase one. And one company, Megavision, understood what I was talking about. And he he said he called the office. He had stuff sent to my house. I had a retinal camera in my garage. And in, and in one day, we put it together and, and made it work as a proof of concept until it got so hot. It was like July that the sensor started getting all noisy because of the heat. Right. And that started me on. Um, and it, it's a, so this is the, this is like the first angiogram we ever did on, on somebody. And, you, you know, I was like thinking maybe it will be almost as good as film. This is better than film. Right. I can see every little blood vessel in that person's retina. Right. And then I knew we had something. So I decided we were going to start a company. And uh, and I did. I had a friend who was president. I mean, this is not just a photo company. It's a medical device company. So it's, it's a whole different, whole different process. You got structure for it. And so he was president of a company and he says, we'd like to invest in this. And uh, we did it. We created a a company called Escalon Medical Imaging. Problem for me is the CEO of it was a, a lawyer who knows nothing about ophthalmology, right? Has a co company that owns a bunch of companies, right? So we create this and we're able to get these fantastic images, better than anything anybody's ever seen. Now, and, but he's like, I'm like, you know, we're like a software company. We need we need to capture these. We need to have databases. We need to have ways to do medical things on them. No, 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 no. This is good enough. We're just going to do this. I'm like, no, it isn't. It's my name. And by this time, I had a reputation within ophthalmology. And so we had this parting of the ways. And I lost a lot of money. Uh, and, and if anybody's ever started their own business, you know, to put two years of your life, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, you know, you're, you're thinking about it constantly, you're working on it, you're making it work. And then all of a sudden it, it's gone. I'm, you know, I can't, I can't go and sell this to people I know because I can't look them in the face knowing that it's never going to be what they expected from me. And so I went to, uh, my wife was down in Florida for a meeting. I went down and visited with her and I came back on a Monday night and my lawyer had put together a, a thing to put out to the community saying that I was no longer with the company. And I, you know, get up in the morning, I'm making coffee, I turn on the TV, and this is what I see. Yeah, the day that I the day that I was gone, and I'm thinking to myself, how terrible on to do this and feeling that, oh, it's just, you know, the end of the world for me. 
do, doing this. And I turn on the TV that morning and this is what I watch. Right. And it puts it in perspective, you know, that again, you know, so you, you get what you need in a sense. Right. Well, two weeks later, I put out the announcement and immediately I had a company call me up and immediately we took the technology there. And immediately that became the de facto standard in the world for photographing the retina. And it was a huge success, but it didn't feel like that on the morning of 9 11. I've done some work, you know, again, around in and around, um, yeah, you know, in Georgia, travel all over. I made this image, and um, that led to two projects. One of at the time we moved here, they were building the Mall of Georgia, right? And so this project became the MAUL of Georgia because at the time everything was being torn down, right? And it was to me, it was being mauled, right? And so that was one project that went one way. And then the other one was I started noticing these chimneys and I started photographing them for years. I'd photograph people would say well, one day on, in the newspaper, there was a, there was a sort of a, uh, antebellum home out in Sparta, Georgia, that was for sale. And I called up and exchanged phones. And fi finally, I, he gets a hold of me. He says, oh, I'm sorry the person decided to take it off the market, but I have some home, Milledgeville, something or man. And I'm like, no, no, no. My wife's a veterinarian. She had a horse. We'd like the land with this. Blah. He says, well, you know, Sparta's in the, in the poorest county in Georgia. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And he goes like, well, why, why have you been there? I said, oh, old Highway 16. I said, I'm a photographer working on a project. There's a bunch of chimneys there that I photograph. He goes, Oh, he says, you mean Sherman Sentinels? And then it dawned on me that all my all my photographs of these of these chimneys were between Atlanta and Savannah, and from Savannah up through South Carolina into North Carolina. Nothing really in North Georgia, and in West Georgia, nothing in Tennessee or Alabama. And so that became my Sherman Sentinels project. But it took years for me to actually find it. It literally probably a hundred or so chimneys before that happened i also you know did knowing that the, the grain scoopers were going to be gone i had to drive between atlanta and buffalo going through kentucky in the back roads and see the the, the tobacco and i'm like thinking you know sooner or later family tobacco farms are going to be gone so i did a project where i found a, a through a friend a family that owned uh, had tobacco and i stayed with them and photographed um and even you know to the whole process uh, even when they these guys are waiting for their check after the the auction, you know, I got invited to do a residency in uh, at the uh, McColl Center for the Arts in in um, Charlotte, and they were looking at my ophthalmic work because they had they had a a residency that was sponsored by Carolina's Medical Center. They brought me in, the board did to. To, to make a presentation, I brought my ophthalmic stuff. I also brought my documentary stuff. And from that, it came that I did, I, I said, you know, what I want to do is I want to find a doctor who exemplifies taking care of the person, not the patient. And so I interviewed 12 doctors and picked the head of the, the emergency service. And it's a level one trauma service. People, I don't know if you know the differences. Level one means you've got helicopters and planes and you and you have you have people that do at least a thousand, you know, serious injuries a year in your. And so I spent three months with them, photograph, flying in the in the in the helicopters, flying in the planes, being there for them around the clock, and, and, and photographing what they do um, as as the project. Um, and then you find out also that just because you made a good project doesn't mean the next one you choose to do is going to be any good, right? And sometimes you sometimes you don't even know you're doing a project. You're making photographs, but they turn out to you. And so the things that I've been doing uh, lately uh, in in Georgia, there's a there's a, a family owned cotton gin in Bostwick, Georgia. And so I've been doing photo I've photographed that a number of times and photographed the cotton uh, process uh, in and around uh, uh, North Georgia, finding out that. Uh, uh, cotton's actually the number one crop in Georgia. We always think of peaches and, <laughs> and peanuts. Um, I was approached way back when Adobe was creating two versions of Photoshop, one called 
extended. I was part of a 12 member biomedical imaging advisory group working with them to put those, those tools into, into Photoshop. Now they come just as part of Photoshop, but back then you bought one over the other version of that. So I did that work and, you know, the, the things like measurements and things that you would do on a medical, technical or research type image. Um, back then I also started a, a, um, a digital imaging institute for science and medicine. And so I, you know, this is back when, you know, most people, you know, were using uh, Scott Kelby, right? And to, to learn digital imaging and Photoshop. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, if we've got, we've got this for medicine and science and research, let me start something to, to actually teach people in that field. Because it's a whole different story about what you do with the medical image than you would do with the fine art image. So I did this, I, and we did, I did work in uh, Sedona, um, and this is, you know, I think it's like anything, I mean, you talk to anybody in the, you know, the, it's, it's the 10,000 hours. I mean, no matter what it is you do, it takes that long before you're actually starting to get where you're just semi good at it. And I think, you know, for me, I totally agree with this. It, it took that many photographs before I really started feeling that I became uh, a good photographer. And I mean, back then it was film. So now it's different with digital, but you know, it was like the, getting good at it just was a ticket into the game, right? I mean, we, yeah, you, know, you had to develop the film, you had to make the prints. There was this whole thing that you had to do before you could actually show the print. And so that was it. And, you know, to me, I, I refer to it as the compulsory. So if you're old enough to remember in, in skating, they had to do the they had to do this thing on the ice where they had to follow this 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 little path right and they were judged on how well they they stand on that line to to say okay now you qualify to actually compete in the in, at the olympics so to me that's the compulsories i did a, a number of projects with a um uh um, a nonprofit called Orbis started in 1980. It's a flying eye hospital. So it's a, an airplane that has operating rooms, exam rooms. It has a, a place to, and it's a skills transfer program that goes all over the world. And uh, the first, the first one I did was to Nigeria where we actually had to have armed guards that we had met at the, at the, at the airport with armed guards, you know, looking at, I went there to, to, to teach, I do in my documentary work, I then also was had the opportunity to photograph what was, what was going on. And um, I did this, I mean, I went to South America, uh, it was Africa, went to um, Philippines, went to Indonesia to, to do these to do these to do these projects, this is this is somebody from the Philippines. I was a hemp worker. Um, I also did work in in you know all this stuff starts to connect because you know, all of a sudden we're using an iPhone and we have a camera in it. Well, can we take that and 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 use it to actually photograph the eye and use it in places like Africa? So, this doctor. Uh, um, discovered um, malaria in, in, in children. And the problem is they die from it if they don't get treated, but there's no infrastructure to actually look at somebody's retina to determine if they have malaria. And it shows up as these spots in the eye, right? So this, you know, it's like kids are getting it and they're dying because nobody knows how to use an instrument. So we, we looked at how can we put together an imaging system to, to 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 photograph their retina and see this so that they could no matter where they were in 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 Africa, I mean there were cell phone service by then. You can send an image and then you could get them taken care of. So um also did work on a on um so you know we, we say the the eye is the window to the soul, but it's also the window to the body. Anything systemically happening to you will show up in the eye. And so then research was done to say, okay, if you have Alzheimer's and you have these amyloid plaques that, that congregate in your brain, and that's some way of, well, is, since the eye's part of the brain, shouldn't we see them in the brain, in the retina? So I worked on a project where we were able to do that of concept of being able to photograph 
the retina, those spots you see are all these very, very small amyloid plaques. So, you know, you had this dr these drugs that were being used, but they were always being used at the end stage of Alzheimer's. So nobody ever got any better. You know, the thing is, catch them early, use the drugs, and then see if it's going to work. Through a long story, which I will not tell, um, my wife and I did a trip to Scotland, 2008. We just drive. I don't have any plan of where I'm going to go, where I'm going to stay. I know when I get there, I know when I leave. And we're going through the highlands, and my wife looks at the map. She says, oh, I have a sky. This looks like a interesting place let's go there and so we book book a, a room at the top of this at the top of the island and uh little did i know that um in 2013 we saw a house on the way up to the to the, ho the hotel or lodge a mile and a half from it we stopped and it was an old two and i say i, I like this school because it, it was a, a two two school it's schoolmaster's house built in 1893 out of stone, you know, with two stories and big windows and, and it was for sale, but it looked like it was terrible. And she says, this is our house. And, you know, this is the first time where we've had conversations like, oh, you think sometime you want a second home, like on the beach or in the mountains, on the lake? It's like, no, we like to travel too much. And she's telling me that that's our house. Now in 2013, we bought it and we've had it now for 10 years. And, uh, and so for me, I mean, I do workshops there now. So once a year, I do a workshop on uh, Isle Sky. Um, yeah, this is an image in 2008. It was this incredible light, clouds, weather. It was like, I, I said on that first morning while I was photographing, if I could live here, it would be the perfect place as a photographer to live. And little did I know. Um, actually, yeah, this is the, our house is the second one from the right up there on that hill going down to the, down to the, but it's very, 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 um, off the beaten path. Um, we're 20 miles from a store, a gas station, anything. There's nothing between us and the, and the, and 20 miles in the town, but beautiful landscape and a few houses. So, it's, yeah, we don't have internet. We don't have TV. Um, we just have our, our mobile phones and we, you know, cut off, but, um, and it's, also it's where I started by exploring the Island. You know, it's, a, it's, there's a difference between looking and seeing. And so I was able to start really being at a place that I can, you know, if we go there for four five, six weeks, I've got my camera much more flexible on making images, terrible weather, stay inside and do something. All of a sudden the sun comes out get in the car and go. So being able to explore and look at it when the light was, 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 was right, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, going through that. We live on a single track road. I don't know if any of you know what that is, but it's only one lane that has traffic going back both ways. So that's how far off we are from, from normal, uh, from normal life. Um, and, uh, I continue photographing there. It's just always, to me, very, you know, uh, amazing. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the weather's changing all the time. This was, uh, you know, a couple of years ago where a hurricane hit, you know, the, the eastern coast and came up. Anytime that happens, it comes across the Atlantic and it hits, it, it hits uh, uh, Scotland. And then here, this is a place called St. Kilda, which most people don't know about. It's it's about a four and a half hour boat ride from from the Outer Hebrides. We're, we're we're there, and this place is, was inhabited for like five thousand years. And in nineteen thirty nine, the people left that were there, the left living there, asked to be removed. And so there's this huge these three islands, and it's a World Heritage site. And there's all these, you know. Um, corrals and fences and houses they just left it and you can't you 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 can't stay there um although i, I have a friend who got permission to go there for uh uh, uh four days uh but if, this is a cemetery i mean in the cemetery it's like that because number one there's no wood to bury anybody and two to keep on piling people up on top of one another over the over the years so um uh, uh 
again, don't cling to a mistake just because he spent a lot of time making it. It had to, it had to be because I, I was spending all this time. So, so here, getting back to Buffalo, I go back and after I stopped my project and now there's all these abandoned grain elevators and we're there in Bob's day and a friend, he says, oh, you want to photograph Silo City? I'm like, what's Silo City? He explains to me. So when I was doing all this stuff with the grain scoopers, I never got to go inside the elevators because of OSHA. They wouldn't let me in there. They didn't want any photographs. So he says, oh, a friend of mine bought 12 acres of these abandoned grain elevators, and we can go in there and photograph. And so I, we go there, and there's a caretaker, and he sort of takes us around, showing us some safety stuff. And at the end of 30 minutes, I said, I can do a workshop here. And my and my friend la laughed in my face and he said, there is no effing way anybody is coming to Buffalo for a photography workshop. Nobody, he said. So I always mentioned that to him and everybody else because I started these and I would limit it to 25. I'd like do two workshops a year and I always had it sold out. And I'm like, well, you, you're really not here because nobody's going to come to Buffalo. Um, I did that for 10 years. And then they started selling off parts of that to be redeveloped. And so I put together a book where I just published it this past year. And um, I had the former director of the George Eastman House curate the images. I invited anybody that had been there to submit images. And we, I wrote an essay, he wrote an essay, and we just published this book, a uh, limited edition. There's still a couple issues, a couple of copies left. Uh, but these are, this is some of the work that yeah I did at, at, at Silo City. Um, it was a two and a half day workshop. Most of the time I wasn't photographing. I was making sure the workshop ran. I started having people come multiple times to the workshop. And um, then that gave me some time. I mean, I had one guy that came to every workshop I ever, I ever did, uh, did there. Um, it was just amazing the 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 light and the you know being able. It was twelve acres and two and a half million square feet of abandoned industrial space, and we could go anywhere we wanted to. And I, and I just everybody go wherever they wanted to go. There was we didn't go as a group, right? And so. Yeah, and after the first workshop, I'm sitting around getting some feedback, and they go, you know, Mark, I, I knew nobody that came to the first one. They said, when we saw this and signed up for it, we said, what are we going to do for two and a half days in one spot? And they're like, in two and a half days, we only just scratched the surface of what's here. And that's why people, the, the, when I did the last workshop, I opened it up. Anybody that wanted to come on the last one, seventy-five percent of the people had had been to multiple workshops on the last one. So you know, learning that. And this this image actually is the last image I made on the against the grain because to me, I always looked at those guys and said, "There's a storm coming, and the storm is automation, and they're going to be replaced by automation, right?" And it was only like ten years later I'm doing the Silo City workshop, and this and this self unloading grain boat comes in. And, and so I like, I'm going to get up early the next morning because I knew where the light was coming and I get there and here's this huge, huge storm coming now th that, that, that sky isn't something I put in there, nor did I really manipulate. That was the sky that was there. And so that's really the end of the, of that, um, uh, that work got, that work got published in lens work, uh, last year, um, you know, typical, typical photographer. I have my website. That I that I have my work in, and I sell the book, I sell my workshops, I sell I sell my photographs. Uh, I'm rep represented here in Atlanta by Lumiere Gallery. Um, I love Vivian Meyer's work, but I don't want to be the next Vivian Meyer, meaning that I don't want to die and then have somebody find my my images. So actually, 2023 was the last. Was my 50th year in photography, and I'm going through my negatives for this against the grain project, and I'm looking at all my work, my 35,000 negatives, all my digital files, and I'm like, I need to catalog this and actually see what I have, rather than going out and making more 
digital assets or more images, right? I mean, I who knows how long I'm going to live, you know? One of my good friends, a photographer, just died two months ago, right? Then I was just at his house two days ago. His wife was having me go through all of his stuff, right? That's happened two other times to me. So it's like, I don't want to be the next Vivian Meyer. I want to have this stuff together and out there. So when I do, um, and then the last, the last one here is, you know, um, I came back from my uh, my trip to the first trip to Africa, and I'm talking to my son in Milwaukee, talk every Sunday, and he says, "Oh, you want to talk to Jay? Jay's my grandson. He's eight years old. Sure, yeah." We're talking, and you know, told him I was in Africa, but yeah, you know, I said to him, "So, what, Jay? What do you want? What do you want to be when you grow up?" And he says, "Well, I want to be like Dad. I want to work on cars because my son does auto body work." He says, "Papa Mark, what do you do?" I said, well, I just told you I was in Africa I'm taking pictures. I said, when I see you and your sister, your family, I take pictures. I says, photographers, you know, make pictures. They, you know, and he's like, you know, it's a, he's like, oh, oh, you just like hear him thinking over the phone, right? His mind is just turning. He goes, oh, well, then I guess everybody's a photographer, right? Because he's grown up with phones, with cameras, and everybody takes pictures. So, you know, uh, it's like, trying to really know what you're doing so um to end you know um you know there's there's and this is how i look at my photographs you know i i want to look i want to be able to see i want to be able to perceive you know a camera looks a mind sees and a heart perceives and so we're you know we're always we're always asked well what's the best lens you know or your friends do this you know to me my answer is viewing the world through the lens of my life experiences that's the best lens that i can that i can have and then you know the best sensor my heart if i feel something you know it's not the, it's not the digital sensor in my camera it's the sensor inside me that tells me that this is something that means something to me that i want to convey to somebody else and then the best processor, you know, the one between my ears, my brain, taking this stuff, putting it together and forcing me to actually press the shutter to, to make that to make that image. Um, so. I, I don't know how long it took, or how long I have, but I'm sorry that I went too long. This is my my website. This is my uh, email. If somebody has, you know, wants to ask me something or whatever. So. Uh, Pages um, you stand behind yeah. Well, I you know I I I redid my website, and I I put all it's like maybe two hundred twenty images on it, and I made them all purchase purchasable as you know, and so I said at the beginning of the year that I was going to take two images a week. And and write the story behind the photograph. So that's what I've been posting yeah. is is you know because people always ask the story, right? So that's what I'm posting and getting the work out. Okay. Now I'm gonna stop share. Yeah, it's stop share. It should. Yeah, it took it right to you. Yeah. But then. Lisa will have to share hers. Yeah. Right, Lisa, are you ready to share your screen? Maybe. You saw. Well, while we wait for Lisa. Uh, we were talking about how we made changes to the monthly photography challenge. So we're going to have a different judge each month. Uh, this month's judge is Dick, actually. Uh, the judge cannot submit an image if they're judging. That would not be fair. Uh, what we're going <clears throat> to do this change is each month, whoever finishes in first place is going to get a $15 gift card. So whoever wins tonight, I don't know who won. Uh, Dick knows who won, but he doesn't know the names of the photographers. It's all done blindly. So, I mean, he told Lisa, image, whatever, this image, this image, this image, you know, for the top five. But he doesn't know who the photographers are yet either. Lisa will reveal. Actually, I do because Lisa told me. Oh, well, Lisa told him, so 
<laughs> don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. But he didn't know when he uh, selected the whole. True. It was blind judging. So, yeah. so the winner each month is going to get a $15 um, Amazon gift card. And then we're still going to add up the points at the end of the year for a photographer of the year, um, fifth, first through fifth place. And photographer of the year will win $100, free membership for next year, and um, the, and the trophy. And it looks like she's got it up. Now she's Are you able up. to see my screen, Mike? We saw it for a second. It was white instead of the uh, screen we had been using. The last couple of years. Sure. Yeah, sure again. Okay. Can you see the? Not yet. Well, while we're getting this organized, a, a few preliminaries. There were 15 images and I was supposed to choose the top five, just like we've been doing all along. Um, so what we're going to do is we will show the 10 that did not get in the top five and then work the five, four, three, two, one at the end. All right. We got, we got okay. it on the screen now. There you go. We're not hearing you though, Lisa. Oops. And we lost Lisa again. And Lisa. So what she what she was showing was the the rules which haven't changed. One image per person. Each image has to be just one file. No uh, composites. And two-year time limit. Yeah. So all of that is still the same. It's just how we're going to determine the winning, the winning images and the extra. Uh, uh, just something as, as an incentive to get more people to participate in the challenge. And it does not matter how much experience you have as a photographer, if you think you're a good photographer or not. We've had people win for who had very little experience. We've had people win who have a lot of experience. You just never know. You just may have a topic that works for you. You may get lucky one month. You just never know. But... Our goal with the challenge is not just to say these are the five best pictures, but to also learn from those images. So, like, it's going to explain why he selected those. So, you can kind of keep that in mind next month. Roll them. At least you're going to have to move back to Georgia. <laughs> I've got my computer. I can fire up and show you the pictures. You want to do that? <laughs> well, she, she's not speaking either, so. Is she muted? She was muted. For the record, this is not me. This is Arizona. Oh, uh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> so that's that's the first image. And I, I will say this about all the theme was rule of thirds. Every single image, because I checked, hold that in your mind. Um, I checked every single image, and indeed, everybody had their stuff. I mean, dead on the thirds. It was it was astounding. It wasn't off by, you know, a quarter inch. It was absolutely spot on. It was amazing. All right. I'm just going to try to email the pictures to me. So, well, I've got the here. My I've got the pictures mm -hmm. somewhere here. I got my computer too. There it is. Okay. So we can just plug my computer in, Mike. 
Oh no, we got to have it for Zoom, don't we? Yeah. All right. Sorry. Bad answer. Um, Worst case scenario, we may have to post the pictures online. Okay. Like we've done once or twice when we had to an issue. Trying to figure out. Yeah, you got a thumb drive, Mike? Do I? You got a thumb drive? Yeah. Because I've got the pictures. I can stick them on a thumb drive. We'll see how this works. Oh, thanks. Loading images on. Isn't no? I need a. I need a. Yeah. I need to see. I need to see. Go ahead you, and see. Yeah, bar. Um. Okay. Do 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 do. All right. So tell you what. Oh, if yeah, if I okay, I can get on Zoom here, Mike. Right. Okay. Oh. Oh. All right, Dick is connecting to Zoom, and then we're going to show the pictures from his uh, computer. All right. I'll play this at work. January meeting. Oh, I see you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you yeah. Okay, so now I've got a share screen. And share. So your pictures right there. You have to share after you select the one. All right. Yeah. Come on, baby. All right. All right, there you go. All right, we're back. We're All back, right. everybody. Whoa, Nelly. No. No, we're not voting. I judge. Dick, 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 Dick was the judge. Which to which A cannot be appealed. <laughs> um, so this is the first image. Um, it's a very nice image. Um, actually looks way better on this screen than it does on mine. Um, but no, I, but I, I, for one reason or another, it didn't strike me as particularly inspiring, particularly when you see some of the other images. We never seen the rule of lyrics. Yeah. Oh, oh there, there's okay. These may not be exactly in order. We'll have to. Um, and. Similarly with this one, it's a nice enough image, but it, it strikes me as that it it didn't speak to me. It didn't tell me anything. Um, although it did absolutely meet the rule of thirds thing, uh, in particular the the tractor is spot on the one third line. Okay. 
Yeah. This one, come on, there we go. Um, <laughs> that's a picture I might have actually taken. You tend to do that a lot. It's a very simple, minimalist kind of thing. Um, and again, it, I, I got to say, it's all 15 pictures are really good. And when you see some of the later ones, you'll understand why, but didn't make the cut. But it is. It, it's something I do. I mean, it's it's a good technique to to isolate the one subject and and leave a lot of vacant space around it. Um, come on, there we go. Uh, and this one, this one, I didn't know what to make of because, to be honest, I'm not really sure what it's a picture of. Um, I mean, there's the guy taking the picture, but is it is that the subject or is the scene he's standing in the subject or what? I, I didn't quite know what to make of it. But again, notice he's on the one third line and you got three distinct sections of the picture. These are all really decent pictures. Lag time here. Imagine if you were in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. And this one, it, it's it's a good picture. I'm not. There's no technical thing wrong with it. There's no compositional thing wrong with it. But it didn't tell me a story. That I mean, again, it's a picture I might well have taken. I'm, I've I've got pictures like that. And you know what? That screen is not really good on the cut. Now, this one was interesting when I got the pictures from Lisa. And brought them up in File Explorer with the with a little thumbnail. I looked at that and I thought that was the hands down winner because it's got this is rule of thirds. It's got three subjects. Each one is in a separate. I mean, you got, you got top, middle, bottom, left, right, center, thirds. And the only problem with that picture is those birds are going the wrong way. <laughs> and so the challenge for Adobe. Where they can they can flip left right and top bottom they got to flip back to front. <laughs> yeah, but from a, from a compositional perspective, well, that, that's a really really good picture. I mean, getting those birds to line up was a trick. Whoever signed their contract ought to get a get a reward. Um. Oh, I hear. Yeah, that 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 uh, that color is really washed out. Um, and this one, again, I I think the the issue I have with this one is a cropping because that bush on the left is just way too distracting for me. If it was cropped so that about the left hand two thirds of that bush was removed, I think it'd be a whole lot better picture. Um, but again, that waterfall. Is right exactly where we're supposed to be for a rule of thirds. Yeah. Boy. Wait, what image are we on here? Where, I must have these in order then. Okay. Um and this one, again, it it's not a bad image. It's it again, it's one I might well have taken. It's got three pieces to it. It's got the cabin, it's got the tree, it's got the whether it's the sun or the moon, I can't quite tell. But again, I'm I'm not sure what it's a picture of. Okay. Now this one is the honorable mention. It's gonna be a little bit out of order. This one got gets the honorable mention. It's a really nice picture. It, that bird is really in sharp focus. The colors are good. It's really a nice picture. Um, but you'll see, we're now getting down to the nitpicking part of this thing when it came to judging. Lisa sent me these things on Tuesday evening, and I looked at them, but I didn't see her emails till Wednesday. Anyway, I looked at them on Wednesday a couple of times, looking again on Thursday a couple of times before I could uh, figure out how to slice the hairs. Um, oops. Back up, back up, back up, back up. This one's out of order. This is another one where, I, come on, 
computer. There we go. Okay. And again, got to apologize. I mean, when I look at my screen, I look at that screen. We got to do something about that screen. We got settings. settings to it. But anyway, again, it, it's a really, really good picture. And to me, the only thing I would change about that picture is I would move that thing from the left-hand third to the right-hand third. Because to me, when I look at that picture, I see the flower, and then I move, and I left the picture. I would have the vacant space on the left and the subject on the right, so when your eye moves, you stop. Okay. This is, if I remember right, where's my book? This is the fifth place image, I think. That's correct, Dick. Double check. Yes, this is the fifth place image, and it was taken by, where to go, Georgia Walker. Um, and that, if you look at my screen over there real quick, you'll see the difference in colors. It's a whole lot better. That That's way washed out. That bird is, is really good looking. And I like that picture primarily because the bird is in real sharp focus. It's got a nice background. You can tell there are leaves barely. And it's got some punch to it, at least if we get the colors right on the screen. Um, so that's fifth place. And this is fourth place by Linda Gray. And and I really like that picture. Hey, I like birds, but it's got terrific color to me. I really like the, the yellow jumps out. And the rest of it's got enough interest to it to make you wander around, at least it did to me, make me wander around the picture trying to figure out what all was in there. And I really would like to know what that bird is sitting on. I can't figure that out. Um, hmm? Flower pot. Flower pot. Ah, I didn't think of that. I kept thinking it was a pipe. Oops, let me go. All right. Which one are we at here? Yeah, so this is third place. No, nope. come on, sync up. There we go. This is third place, Jamel Sop. Um, and he's the only one who's signed his image. Um, and and again, I, I really like that because it's got a bunch of things going on in the picture. Um, when I first looked at it, actually, I thought maybe that was a model railroad train. But it's not, I don't think. We should have. Jim Alsop. I don't know where it is, but it, but it, to me, it's got a lot of interest all the way around, and it's got, again, those colors are washed out. It's really got way better color. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could be. Could be. I, I mean, looking at the background, I thought those were aspens back there. So, all right. This is number two by Linda Jackson and yeah, with Darknet. That that one just strikes me as a really, really excellent composition. Uh, I like the sky, it's got a couple of different leading lines, the boardwalk on the right and the grasses on the left. And then it's got that uh, water tower, not water tower, lighthouse. Senior moment there. Um, and when I first looked at it, I thought, oh man, Where's the thirds? Well, that's the lighthouse. And this is one of those pictures where you really want the horizon in the middle because you want the, the full lighthouse, both top and bottom. Um, and then that brings us to the winner, one way or the other. Where is it? There it is. By Kevin Mooney. Applause. Oh, not mine. Come on. Not that one. There we go. Okay. And again, and so that one spoke to me that it's got rule of thirds all over it because it's got the light colored sky, the pink colored sky, and then the bottom green part is thirds. The tree trunk is exactly on the thirds left to right. Um, and to me, it's the sort of picture that I could see hanging on a wall someplace. 
right? I mean, it, it, it really is a, a really nice composition, really nice colors. Um, and what I want to know is where was it taken? Uh, that was taken on off of Mount Vernon Road in Gainesville, um, in the North Hall area at a field that has been there forever and has always been surrounded by a wooden fence, which no longer exists, oh. which kind of let me access it on the side of the road. Ah, okay. Neither. No trespassing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I looked and looked and looked at the background and trying to figure out whether that was in Georgia or not in Georgia. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. Congratulations to the uh, winners, Kevin and the And uh, Lisa will post the winning images on uh, Facebook so people who weren't at the meeting can see them and that way. Um, the winners can get recognition and uh, we'll start the tally for. Uh, so, how do I unshare myself here? We'll start the tally for this year. So, right now, Kevin is your leading person. Uh, stop, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, we have just one more slide to go, and that's on my screen. So next month, remember, our meeting is not on Friday. It is on Thursday, Thursday, February 15th at 7 p.m. here at the Bowen. Our presentation is going to be uh, Mike Robertson on black and white photography. Mike's here tonight. Um, and uh, Mike, would you like to judge our monthly challenge next next month also? You don't have to. It's up to you. <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll turn down the judge so we will find a judge. Okay. Um, we may get him to do another one, though. So we'll go over the themes and see what what he would like to do. But our photo challenge theme next month is animals. Uh, we did not put any rules on that, so they could be domesticated animals. They can be pets. Uh, pets, not pets. What we'll make pets? They like got beetle or something is an animal, or it could be. Um, you know, birds, wildlife, whatever, as long as it's an animal. And that's it. Thank you for coming out tonight. Wait, oh. you got a question? Oh, no. no. <laughs> we'll find somebody, Michelle. We'll find someone. No fear. It won't be me. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming out in the cold or watching at home i hope the technical issues weren't too bad tonight and we will see you uh next month and hopefully we'll see some of you um at a thoughts furnaces next month good night everybody cool.